any of you read what this was going to be about? What struck you about it? I, I felt like I always need help. Mm -hmm. With prayer specifically? Yeah, with prayer specifically. Do you mind elaborating on that? Help in, in what way? You know, um, hmm. I, I I don't know. Praying for the right things, not being not being simplistic about prayer, uh, not being self-serving about prayer. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because, you know, we just heard the gospel reading from Matthew where Jesus says, you know, whatever you ask the Father in my name, it will be done. Right. And yet, that, that doesn't give us, you know, a blank check to just ask for, you know, anything. And I don't think that's Jesus's point. That's not what he's saying there. He's talking about basic necessities and needs. Um, you know, you don't pray that you're gonna your scratch off is gonna win million dollar a million dollars. I mean, you can pray for that. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think God cares about that. How about if we score a touchdown? <laughs> yeah, I've always said God is, is not one to care about sports very much. But what you can pray for is uh, that it's a um, – that no one's seriously hurt in the game yeah. and that it's played with fairness and integrity. And, you know, that's where free will comes in. I mean, the game is decided by the people who play it, but let's ask for protection for the people who play it that they may be kept safe while they play. My high school coach uh, uh, always prayed for humility, whether we win or lose. And yeah. I thought that was pretty good. Well, then, let, let me ask you this. What, what do you think prayer is? Um, I, I, I guess the older I get, the more I think it's a conversation. Okay. Yeah, I think that's fair. When I, you know, it's it's changed a lot since I joined the cathedral. Um, because growing up Catholic, you're just told to, you know, if you go to confession or whatever, you're told to go say three Hail Marys and one Our Father or whatever, and and then you're done. And so that was the only way I really understood prayer. Um, but having gone on retreat and things like that, it's um, I learned a lot. But those are prayers. Yeah, they are. We're going to talk about the like, Lord's Prayer. I thought that was the only way to do it, though. Okay. I didn't know there were that you did, that you could freestyle it, for lack of a better way of saying it. <laughs> and that's kind of what I I I'm a big freestyler. <laughs> so when I pray, a lot of times I'm 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 talking to God, like I would be talking to you guys, and I often wonder if maybe there should be a little bit more meat on the bones as far as protocol, you know? I mean, I know we ask in Jesus's name and we give him praise and thanks, but I'm a freestyler. So I'm looking to pick up some tips. But, but, okay. does, prayer, but does prayer always have to be um, talking or conversation? I don't think so. All right. Say more about that. Well, when, especially when you're out in nature, when you're part of nature, um, and you're full of wonder, I don't think you have to say anything, but I think that can, that can be prayer. Okay. But, it, but it, it takes your presence there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there, you are active in a way, though you may not be saying anything. Right. Okay. And it's a it's a connection. It's a connection to God, without having to say words. So, what would you say to the people who 
And I agree with you. Don't get me wrong. What do you say to the people who say, um, I don't need to go to church on Sunday. I go to the golf course and I pray to God on the golf course. Yeah, well. They're praying to the God of golf. Yeah. Now, one could say they are they are at one with nature and they are communing with nature in that sense. But if they're praying for straight, long drives and good putts, then that's not quite the same thing, right? Right. Right. I might live with someone who thinks he encounters God on a mountain on a Sunday morning instead of at a church. Well, now that's, that is possible. Mm-hmm. If they're actually on the mountain. Uh, he often is. <laughs> I like uh, the legs. mentions that they feel like they need more structure because she was really good at extemporaneous prayer. I am not. I struggle if it's not from, sorry for my dog squeaking. I struggle if it's not from the prayer book. So I like our rubrics and I like knowing that I have a page to turn to and there's something from every season. But I struggle when I'm in settings and someone asks like, can someone pray for this? Um, especially out loud. I struggle coming up with things just extemporaneously. So we get criticized a lot in the Episcopal Church for having written prayers, for relying on the prayer book and for not having this, um, this perceived ability to just pray on demand, right? And one of the things that I've always said to people, and, and it's been told to me, I didn't make it up, so this is not something Andy invented, uh, was that the prayer book gives us the words when we can't find them. So I'm sure we all have a way of praying on our own, just in our own minds, because, you know, extemporaneous prayer, if you're doing it publicly out loud, yes, it can put you on the spot, and yes, it might make you nervous, but if you're just sitting by yourself and you're praying, that is extemporaneous prayer because you're saying things. A lot of times I have people will come to me and say, I don't know how to pray. And my first thought is, do you ever have thoughts in your head? Do you ever think about God? Do you ever talk to God in your head? And they say, well, yeah. And I say, well, that's prayer. I mean, that is a form of prayer. And and I've heard some of you say it tonight already. I am a big fan of the ongoing conversation. Uh, of waking up in the morning to say, okay, God, thank you for bringing me to this new day. Here we go. And it's just open. And, you, and I sort of talk to God all throughout the day. In various ways and different things, and I may actually I may do it out loud in my car, <laughs> um, and then and then at night I can give thanks for what for the events of the day and and other prayers I may want to add as I go to sleep and then I go to sleep. So there's all different kinds of way to pray, ways to pray. And Alexander, I think really what you're what I hear you saying is you like that structure that the prayer gives. What you find is as you read those prayers and you, and you internalize those prayers and you get to know those prayers, you, you begin to understand some of that formula and how those prayers are put together. So then if you are asked to pray in public, you can kind of draw on that structure and be able to sort of formulate something in that in that sense, and and that's that's perfectly fine. We're gonna um, spoiler alert for for next week. We're gonna talk about collects, uh, and there is a structure to collects. There is a way to form a collect that fits into these categories, and and once you learn that structure and understand what you're doing, and, and we're talking. Excuse me, we're talking about different parts of prayer that we're going to talk about tonight. Adoration or oblation or petition or intercession. Once you learn what all those pieces are, then that makes it a lot easier to sort of 
put it into some sort of structure, which worked for some people. For other people, extemporaneous is just the way to go. You don't want the structure, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and so we're going to talk about some of those things. Uh, so I wanted to, to share this. Jeff, you've just joined us. Uh, we're talking about what people, how people sort of explain prayer, what prayer means to them. Mm. I'm not saying you have to answer. I'm just telling you where we are. One of the things that's interesting, though, before we move on, um, particularly when it comes to people who are sick, or people who are dying. And I don't want to upset anybody by saying this, but but I will often tell people, especially in if they come to me in these times of grief, you know, we have to be careful what we what we ask for in prayer. To say to God, your will be done, may not agree with what we want, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So, to, in other words, to, to pray for healing might mean a different thing to us than it means to God. And, and I just put that out there because that's, that's a very gray area, and I know that can be upsetting to some people, and I'm not trying to upset anybody. Uh, but I, but I do say it, it is. It helps to be specific when we pray. All right. Let me share this with you. This is from a great book I have called An Episcopal Dictionary of the Church, a User-Friendly Reference for Episcopalians by Don S. Armentrout and Robert Boak Slocum. Don Armentrout was my church history professor in seminary. He's a, he was, was, he's deceased now. He was a um, ordained Lutheran minister in the ELCA. And this is their definition of prayer. The experience of corporate or individual nearness with God through words, Acts or silence. Any act or activity offered to God in a spirit of dedication may be prayerful. This nearness may take the form of addressing God as in prayers of petition, praise, and thanksgiving, or the form of listening as in contemplative and meditative prayer. Both forms assume a relationship between God and the one who prays. Prayer is the opening of the direct relationship between God and humanity. The Catechism states, Christian prayer is response to God the Father through Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. So how does that fit with what we've just been talking about? Linda, it definitely gets your silence in there. It's a connection. I think it's a connection with God. I think that's what this is saying, right? It is. Uh, and you've heard me talk, I think some of you have heard me talk before about thin places. Uh, those places where we, we personally connect to God directly. That could be a particular hike you take. It could be on the mountain. It could be uh, in a certain room. It could be in the cathedral. I mean, there are all kinds of places where we can call it a thin place because just to sit in silence in that space, you feel connected to God. And that is a form and type of prayer. When we look at a um, contemplative style of prayer or meditative prayer, something such as centering prayer. Does anyone do centering prayer? Yes. So that, that is one of those ways where you are, you are in silence and you, you sit in a certain way and you, you posture yourself in a certain way to be open and receptive, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that you can hear God. Um, yoga is very much that sort of a thing. 
Have you ever been to a Society of Friends meeting? I have not. I have. I know people who have. I've talked to people about it. I have not personally been to one. Okay. Well, oh, sorry. You know, um, growing up outside of uh, West Branch, Iowa, uh, you have a you have an invitation on a more regular basis <laughs> than. <laughs> you do uh, in some other parts of the country. And I've been to several weddings there where, you know, it is a response to God, you know, how God moves you or interacts. And sometimes it's just, an observation on what's going on. In a lot of ways, it's, I've always liked it to sort of Christian Zen meditation. You know, that you set yourself up, you center yourself, you open yourself, and you just kind of like Look around, see what's going on. Yes. What what we sometimes refer to as navel gazing. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I've never thought about my navel. <laughs> <laughs> it's that it's that deep it's that deep looking within. Is that E L or A L? <laughs> while opening yourself up, <laughs> yeah, it's it's um, you know, uh, while opening yourself up, and it's a and it, and I will say this, that style and form of prayer works very well for some people and not well at all for other people. And that's why the Society of Friends is a very small denomination. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I will say, you know, the discipline of centering prayer, I understand it. I think it's a wonderful uh, discipline. I, I am horrible at it. Uh, I have tried it many, many, many times, and I am just not good at that, at that form of discipline. But I'm good at other disciplines. <laughs> so prayer is a personal thing in a lot of ways, isn't it? And yes, we're going to get to... We're going to get to the Gospels where the disciples ask Jesus to teach them to pray, and Jesus will do that. But what we have to understand is prayer can take on different forms, and, it, and, it, and not any one form is going to be the right way for every person. So what I hope we get out of this at the end of this class is that we all can pray in our own way that suits us the best and allows us that open channel to God, right? Mm -hmm. So let's look at the catechism. And see what that says about different types of prayer. So here we are in the catechism. Prayer and worship. What is prayer? Prayer is responding to God by thought and by deeds, with or without words. What is Christian prayer? Christian prayer is response to God the Father through Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. What prayer did Christ teach us? Our Lord gave us the example of prayer known as the Lord's Prayer. What are the principal kinds of prayer? Principal kinds of prayer are adoration, praise, thanksgiving, penitence, oblation, intercession, and petition. So let's see what those are. Adoration is the lifting up of the heart and mind to God, asking nothing but to enjoy God's presence. That would be uh, like in the collect structure to say, um, gracious God, you know, we're blessed to, to, to worship you and to be in your presence, something like that, right? 
when we sing um, the Gloria, that's that's adoration. That's also praise. We praise God not to obtain anything, but because God's being draws praise from us. For what do we offer thanksgiving? Thanksgiving is offered to God for all the blessings of this life, for our redemption, and for whatever draws us closer to God. What is penitence? I think we all understand this one. In penitence, we confess our sins and make restitution where possible for the intention to amend our lives. What is prayer of oblation? Oblation is an offering of ourselves, our lives, and labors in union with Christ for the purposes of God. Where we will hear oblation a good bit is in the Eucharistic prayers. And we'll talk about that as we get into these individually. What are intercession and petition? Intercession brings before God the needs of others. In petition, we present our own needs that God's will may be done. So as we get into the Lord's Prayer in just a bit, we're, we're going to talk about petitions because that's a lot of that prayer has to do with petitions. What is corporate worship? Corporate worship, we unite ourselves and others to acknowledge the holiness of God, to hear God's word, to offer prayer, and to celebrate the sacraments. So the prayer book gives us really two forms of worship, doesn't it? It gives us the, the rights for corporate worship, and it gives us rights for individual prayer, doesn't it? And that's something we'll touch on later in this course, uh, using the prayer book for individual prayer, and that would be praying the offices or, or daily devotions, things like that, right? Any questions on that, on the, the forms of prayer in the catechism? Nope. All right, then I'm going to do this right now. So we hear many times in the Gospels that Jesus went off, oftentimes alone, to pray, right? We'll hear that Jesus went up the mountain, or Jesus slipped away, or Jesus did this to go pray. And oftentimes we hear how the disciples <laughs> hunted, literally hunted after him to find him. We also hear of Jesus praying before significant turning points in his ministry. Um, especially at uh, Transfiguration, at uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, things like that. And we hear, we hear about Jesus praying with the disciples at the table. The disciples watch this, and they want to know more about it. In Luke's Gospel, in chapter 11, we are told that the disciples watch Jesus while he prays. When he is done, prompted by his own practice of prayer, they ask him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And Jesus answers them, saying, When you pray, say, and then he goes on to give us Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer. <clears throat> The only, the only prayer taught to us directly by Jesus. And, and oftentimes in the liturgy, you'll hear us, you'll hear the clergy bid us to the Lord's Prayer and say, let us pray in the words our Savior Christ has taught us, right? That's the cue for, it's the Lord's Prayer. When we do the Eucharist, uh, the right to Eucharist, because it's not an option in right one, but in the right to Eucharist, the words the celebrant says tells us which version of the Lord's Prayer we are to pray. So we'll break the bread. Or no, no, we do the great elevation. We haven't broken the bread yet. We do the great elevation, and then we'll say, and now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say. And that means we're going to say the traditional Lord's Prayer. 
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But it, but if the celebrant says, um, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we now say. That means we're going to do the contemporary version of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Uh, which is slightly different, right? Mm -hmm. And we had a big talk about this <laughs> one night about the contemporary Lord's Prayer. It's the same prayer. It's just different language. And we're going to see that in just a minute when I put up uh, a comparison here. What we know historically is that by the first century, there were set prayers uh, in the Jewish world. A devout Jew would repeat prayers in the morning and again in the evening. And if the situation prohibited reciting these prayers in their entirety, a shorter version could be said. And apparently by what the disciples ask in Luke's gospel, we assume that John the Baptist had a set prayer that his own disciples used. Uh, and that is John the Baptist because we know from John's gospel that it is John's followers who come to Jesus, Andrew and the other disciple, who come to Jesus uh, and ask him where he's staying. So it would be followers of John the Baptist. So there's a set prayer. So now we have these, these disciples who are trying to figure all this out. They're trying to, to understand what Christ wants them to do. And they simply say, Lord, teach us to pray. And then we get Luke's version of, of the Lord's Prayer. We hear, we hear it as well in Matthew. Matthew also gives us a version of the Lord's Prayer, but it's in a slightly different context. So in Luke, we have the disciples asking Jesus to teach them to pray. But in Matthew, it's also direction on prayer, but it doesn't have the disciples asking to be taught. Does anyone know what the context is in Matthew off the top of your head? This is in chapter 6. Think of Ash Wednesday. Not, not in the terms of them doing Ash Wednesday in the gospel. What we read on Ash Wednesday. <laughs> repentance? What's that? Like repentance? Well, no, specifically what the gospel is. Every year on Ash Wednesday, we read the same gospel, and it's from Matthew. And it's from this section. It's the, the Sermon on the Mount section isn't it? it yeah it's it's sort of the summer of the mount starts in chapter five this is getting towards the end of it but yes and so he, uh, so jesus is talking to the disciples and he's teaching them about prayer and he says beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them does that sound familiar to anybody which yeah. if you came to ash wednesday service as you heard me say it's it makes no sense to me that we say this on ash wednesday you know he goes on to say um you know when you give alms don't show everybody that you're doing it do it do it in secret and when you pray don't show everybody that you're doing it do it in secret when you fast don't look like you're in, you're miserable because you're fasting right and yet on that same day we get a very visible sign put on our head. So it seems to contradict exactly what we're doing, right? But it's in, it's in Jesus teaching the disciples on prayer. And what, and what we don't get on Ash Wednesday is in that middle section when Jesus is talking about when you pray, don't pray like the hypocrites and do this, but pray like this. And then he says, and when you pray, say, and he gives the, the Lord's Prayer. And then he goes on and says, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites and do this. So we skip that the Lord's Prayer section on Ash Wednesday when we do that gospel reading. And Jesus says, pray then like this. And he begins, he begins that prayer, right? So we have the disciples in Luke saying, Lord, teach us to pray. And I believe this is a request we've all made at some point in our lives. 
whether to somebody or out loud to God. And not that we called somebody Lord, but, <laughs> but we've asked people to help us with prayer, right? Um, you know, as children, we may make this request to our parents, being taught how to pray before meals or before going to bed. And maybe we didn't make that request. Maybe our parents just taught us that. You know, we pray before we eat. We pray before we go to bed. I can remember um, as a child, you know, I, I would I would pray when I went to bed. But I remember when I went to my aunt's house, to this one aunt with my cousins, we had to literally line up along the side of the bed on our knees while she watched over us. And, you know, my dad's the priest. I never had to do that at home. But we had to line up and we had to say the same prayer every time. Uh, and, 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 and you know the prayer, you know, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And when I would say it at home, I would say, if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. But my aunt didn't like that line. And she would not allow us to say that. She's like, no, that's awful. We're not going to say that. So what's the alternative? Um, uh, now I'm going to say, pray, Lord, my soul to keep. Guard me through the starry night and waken me at morning's light. So that's what we would say. And then we would say, God bless. And we go through every person in the family. And so I think my aunt just wanted to hear us pray for her. That's what she needed. <laughs> So we do that, but as we get older, we might make this request of other people, people we look up to, people we see as mentors uh, or guides, perhaps clergy. Um, and here we often are praying for ourselves or others because we need the comfort of knowing someone is looking out for us. As adults, we may make this request so that we can pray again for our own needs, but also for our children our family, or our friends. And certainly at some point, we've all made the request to Jesus, just as the disciples did in Luke's gospel. Lord, teach us to pray. But now it may change slightly to, Lord, help me to pray. In other words, I, we think we know how to pray, at least we know how to, have, how to have that conversation, but help me to do it. You know, we're not always sure what to say or how to say it. That's where that structure might come in. We don't want to sound greedy by going to God and saying, give me this or give me that. But we also want to make our requests known. So what do we do? So let's look now at the two versions we're given of the Lord's Prayer. And I have here two different versions. We have the Revised Standard Version, and then we have the New Revised Standard Version. So let's take a look at what Matthew says. So this is in the Revised Standard Version. Jesus says, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Sounds more or less like the prayer we say that we all know is the Lord's Prayer, right? Mm -hmm. Luke is much thinner. Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Now, if we look at it in the NRSV, which is the translation we use on Sundays, Matthew says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial but rescue us from the evil one. And Luke says, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins 
For we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us and do not bring us to the time of trial. So more or less, we're going from right one to right two. <laughs> uh, just simple language shifts, except in the end, instead of lead us into temptation, we get uh, do not bring us to the time of trial. Traditionally, we pray in that Elizabethan language. So I'm going to put them on these right now. Now, Pope Francis had a uh, issue with that, you know, lead us not into temptation, um, which, you know, uh, as I understand it, you know, he was saying, God does not lead us into temptation ever. Right. So, and from what I understand, he wanted to just drop that whole sentence out there. Yeah, does it sound better to say and do not bring us to the time of trial rather than lead us not into temptation? Those are two very different uh, meanings. Right. And, and in our contemporary version of Lord's Prayer, that, that's the way we say it. You know, do not bring us to the time of trial. Jesus says in the Gospels to, to the disciples, you know, pray that you do not come into the time of trial. So he's reiterating those words. But I Andy, do think... Andy, yeah. it makes me think it's a translation issue um, at, the, at the point of Matthew. Right. You know, um, so often when we talk about collects, when we talk about collects and how they change over time, um, I can only imagine that uh, uh, in the translation, do not lead us, lead us not into te temptation was not the true original meaning. Because of God, of course, God has nothing to do with leading us into temptation. Although the evil one exists by God's choice. Right. Right. So I do think that do not bring us into the time of trial makes more sense uh, in that respect. But look how, look how um, full. Fuller Matthew's version is than Luke's. And historically, you know, both Matthew and Luke are drawing on Q as a source. And yet Luke's is very sparse. <laughs> and I think in Luke's the physician, Luke's the one about healing. I think Luke was just trying to say, this is what's important. Just hit these points, right? What we, what we get here are three, the, the prayer breaks down into two parts. We get three petitions concerning God's glory, and then we get three concerns for our own needs. And then later, the church will add a doxology to it. But we don't have, that Jesus doesn't give us that doxology, right? So we have a difference here in the opening father versus our father in heaven. And then we get the, the petitions, three petitions concerning God's glory. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Uh, your kingdom come. Your will be done. Uh, all of which, and then Matthew adds on earth as it is in heaven. Luke doesn't add that. But you could add that to everything. Hallowed be your name. Your name is the greatest above all others on earth and in heaven. Your kingdom come, 
meaning we on earth await your kingdom, which you have promised to us in your covenant with Abraham. Your kingdom come on earth and in heaven. Your will be done. Meaning, just as Jesus prays in the garden, not what we want, but what you want on earth and in heaven. So you can fill it out a little bit there. <laughs> Luke just says, Hallow be your name and your kingdom come. He doesn't add, your will be done. Then we turn to ourselves, right? What do, what do, what do we ask? Give us this day our day of the bread. This is the petition for us that, that we may have food, both literally and spiritually, right? Forgive us our sins or our debts or our trespasses for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us and I think to me this is the most important line of the whole prayer in our traditional version we say um, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us we ask for forgiveness of our sins not only in so much as we offer the same forgiveness to others. So if we're unwilling to forgive others, why should we expect God to forgive us, right? And this falls in a good thing we're talking about it because, as Jeff knows, this Sunday we're going to talk about forgiveness, aren't we? As we ask for forgiveness, we also need to be able to forgive others. We cannot ask for ourselves what we deny to others. And sometimes I think when we say this, when we recite the Lord's Prayer and we say this, I think it, it, it has very deep meaning for all of us. But I think some people say it and don't even think about the words they say. Now, I'm not going to judge somebody for doing that, but I think it could be easy to do that. You know, what we're actually saying is, forgive us just as we forgive others, right? You know, Andy, you were mentioning thin places, and to your point, for many who, who read this prayer, it is not a thin place, but, but for those who um, encounter it in a, on a regular basis and, 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 and think on it deeply, it definitely is a thin place. It brings you closer to God, nearer to God. So my family is from Boston and we go back to visit them quite often and when we're there we go to the Society of St. John the Evangelist for a church that's kind of our home church when we're in Boston and they sing the Lord's Prayer and it's not um, you know we don't sing it typically on Sundays in the cathedral so it's not as rote as saying it and I find that when we're there and we're singing the Lord's Prayer that I have to think about the words a lot more um, yeah, yeah, you got you do. Yeah, anything that gets you kind of out of your typical worship routine, I find really makes me meditate on what you're saying uh, quite a bit more, which I appreciate. We do uh, the five o'clock service when we're doing our typical lineup. The five o'clock service, we do sing the Lord's Prayer. Um, even sometimes saying the contemporary language, which isn't my norm you stop and you really have to think about those phrases just because it's different. It's not coming just straight from a place of memorization. Right. Right. And it can, it can take on different meaning to, to you personally when you, when you do it. And so sometimes it is, I think it is good to shake up prayer a little bit <laughs> for that very reason. But I'll, I'll, here's one thing. I'll say about the Lord's Prayer. It is the only prayer 
that we say in, I believe, every service of the church. So whether we're doing a Eucharist or an office or a daily devotion or anything, the Lord's Prayer is always included because it is, it is the prayer that Jesus taught us. And it's also sometimes the only prayer in those particular offices or other services that we say together as a community. It's the one prayer we can all say together uh, that everybody's a part of. And I remember my father used to get upset um, when he would do a wedding or something like that and they'd have a soloist who wants to sing the Lord's Prayer at the time of the Lord's Prayer and he and he never wanted to let them do that. And, and I would say, well, why can't they do that? They're just singing the Lord's Prayer. He said, because that's the one prayer we all say together. So we need to say it together as a community. If they want to sing a solo of the Lord's Prayer, fine, do it as a prelude or do it at another part of the service. I'm not going to tell them they can't do it, but you can't take it away from the people at the service. Yeah. And that does make a lot of sense because it's the one prayer that we've all, we're all taught um, and that we say together. Um, now, here's, yeah. yeah. Uh, I was going to say that coming from a background where at least seasonally we would sing the Lord's Prayer rather than speak it, um, it always, uh, I, I would see people in the congregation that were not singers then not pray the Lord's Prayer out loud anyway when we sang it. Um, and, and I always felt like that was uh, kind of taking something away from, from them. Now, uh, per, perhaps uh, on a monotone chant, it isn't uh, as much of an issue, but, but if it is actually a, a singable tune, some people just don't sing singable tunes. Right, right. Right, and that's, but at the same time, it's being offered for everyone to participate in. Right. Yeah, and and even if that. even if they're not doing it, it may be their choice. And it may it, it may be that they just can't do it. So yeah, they you do run the risk of, of pulling people outside of that by putting them in a situation where they don't feel like they can participate. Uh, one could also say, well, if if others in the church are doing it, they're doing it on behalf of the church and you're getting the benefit of it. And you can say it along with it. You can. Yeah. Now I'm not. I'm not making excuses for doing it. The other. I never, never, ever want to exclude anybody in any way whatsoever. So I, you I, do have to be careful when you when you yeah. set out these practices. I just happen to know he does prefer singing it. <laughs> just so you know that. Hi. <laughs> right, here's if I can throw in a, a modern day anecdote. Um, this was something interesting. So last night, Beth and I have been watching, um, re-watching The West Wing on Netflix. Mm -hmm. Is that, is, are you all familiar with The West Wing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in this particular episode last night, I don't think I'm going to give any way, away any spoilers if you're not into the show or haven't watched it. So the president goes to visit wounded soldiers at Walter Reed Hospital. And he's talking to him and, and he says to one of them, is there anything I can do for you? And the, the soldier says, will you, will you pray with me? And the president puts his hand on, I think he had an injured hand or something and he touches his hand and he says, he starts to say the Lord's Prayer. And I thought, my first instinct was, well, he asked you to pray for him, so why don't you just say a prayer that, you know, is praying for him? Instead, you said the Lord's Prayer. And then I had to stop myself and say, well, I'm about to teach a class talking about the Lord's Prayer, and it's the prayer that Jesus taught us to say and that we all say. So 
if anything, it's almost the most appropriate prayer to say. And it was interesting how I sort of caught myself there. But of course, I'm my in my profession, I'm one who prays all the time, and and I will pray on the spot for specific needs. But it just struck me as funny that he started in with the Lord's Prayer, and yet that's the prayer that we all know and we all can say together, right? Right. And it, and of course, in TV show Magic, it was very moving. <laughs> so, so another question I have about the Matthew NRSV version, um, and do not bring us to the time of trial, whereas uh, in, the, in the common book of, uh, book of common prayer, it is save us from the time of trial. To me, that's different meaning. Do not bring us to the time of trial versus save us from the time of trial. Save us from the time of trial. Well, you're right, because this suggests we don't have to go there at all, and the prayer book suggests we're going to get there. <laughs> so help us when we do. Yeah. I mean, I think the prayer book makes more sense because it's like what we say in the, in the baptismal covenant, you know, when we sin, mm -hmm. when you sin, will you repent and return to the Lord? And, and we, we've told this before, but um, we really like what someone had written uh, when they thought we ought to pray, save us, save us in the time of trial instead of, from, we're going to have trials, right? So, you know, save us in the time of trial. Isn't that how it went? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the Lutherans didn't adopt that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a theologian who thought we ought to say that. There's a lot of theology uh, in this. There's there a lot of there are a lot of different paths. Um, and a lot of different beliefs. So the Calvin Calvinists would have a would have a different uh, shade on it. Certainly, the Lutherans and the Catholics would. And well, and and even how we how we take it from this point. So this is this is the prayer as Jesus presented it. And in if you are familiar with the offices, uh, particularly noonday prayer and Compline. That's the prayer. That's where we stop. Deliver us from the evil one, right? Um, right. But deliver us from evil. Uh, we don't add that doxology because that was not a part of the prayer that Jesus taught. And, you know, the Roman Catholics will tell you, well, you know, that's not part of the Lord's Prayer. Yet even at a, at a Roman Catholic Eucharist, they'll stop at evil and then the priest will say something, and then everyone will chime back in with the doxology. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I, they um, say it, but they don't, it's not tacked onto the end of the prayer. But where does that doxology come from? Does anybody know that? Other than Henry VIII added it, but where did he get it from? Is that a psalm? It's not a psalm, but it's related to a person who's integral in the Psalms. <laughs> is, is the answer who is David? It is David. It comes from David. <laughs> so it, it, it it's based on a prayer offered by David in uh, the first book of Chronicles. David gives, gives thanks to God and prays, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of our ancestor Israel, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, are the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and on the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. That's what David says. And that is actually, those exact words are actually one of the offertory sentences that we can say during a Eucharist. And I've used that before. Um, but then... What the early church did is they condensed that prayer down to, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And uh, the word amen from the Greek 
Amen, which means so be it. So that was added on uh, in the early church. Well, early, um, we're talking, what, 16th century. <laughs> so not that early. I just think it's funny when I, um, when you talk about the Catholics, because that's how, when I was at the age, we could tell who was Catholic and who wasn't. Because um, they went on, they continued they on. <laughs> yeah. They didn't pause for the priest and then continue on? They did not. That's so real, Robin. I got caught in that so many times at Zion. <laughs> oh, yeah. You just don't even think. Of, I mean, you know, we know, you know, growing up Catholic, you know you stop. But, yeah, you're sitting there in the all-school math, and you're like, ah, okay. I, so I tell people, whoever's reading Compline or um, or Noonday Prayer, if they're if they're leading it, You've got to be ready to jump in with that um, with that line and, and deliver us from evil. And you got to be ready to come right in with that line because if you give too much of a pause, everyone will just keep going with the Lord's prayer, even if they're holding it in front of them and reading it. They just keep going. It's just habit. Lord, hear our prayer and let our cry come to you. That's what we add in the offices. So this conclusion sums up all that we've said in the prayer. It is your kingdom, Father. You have the glory and honor and power for all time. We humble ourselves before the greatness of God, offering our thanks for all that God has given us and simply asking to be forgiven as God's children and to be received into the household. It is a simple prayer at its basic shape and form, but it's a very powerful prayer. And as we've all already said tonight, we all, depending on, on the denomination or, or the translation, it can take on some different words, although it's the same prayer, right? We always, I would always grow up, growing up, if someone said debts, I knew they were Presbyterian. Um, and then Beth would always make fun of me because the Episcopalians will say in the doxology forever and ever, amen, where the Methodists would just say forever, amen. Can it be more ever than forever? Well, yeah, it can. It can be forever and ever. Or so we say. <laughs> Well, next week, we're going to start looking at the collects uh, and the structure of a collect and how those are built and how those are made. And I hope that sounds interesting to you because they're kind of fun to, when you dissect them that way. That's when you start looking at those different forms of prayer, of adoration and petition and oblation and um, intercession and things like that. Does that work for everybody? Yeah. All right, so now we'll move on to Compline, and I will ask 